McLaren is a Formula One team with incredible heritage. The cars driven by Lando Norris and Oscar Piastri today have the same championship winning DNA that has permeated through the team's race cars for more than 60 years. And that is thanks to people like Neil Oakley. McLaren have won the Constructors' Championship in Australia just as they won the Drivers' Championship with Ayrton Senna in Japan. A magnificent season for McLaren. There are their happy mechanics pouring out of the garage onto the pit lane to greet their man home. Constructors' Championship for McLaren, Drivers' Championship for Mika Hakkinen. Without those hard working hours for the people in the factory, uh, for the designers, we still wouldn't be winners. But because there has been such a hard work for everybody, uh, here we are, we won the championship. Neil is one of the most humble and influential F1 engineers of all time. A world champion designer who won with Williams and then won more with McLaren. In his 45-year career, he's worked with the greatest racers and experienced the fiercest rivalries. None more iconic than Alain Prost and Ayrton Senna. He was taking things to a different level compared to what Alan had been used to. I mean, Alan was still in the mode where he'd, Saturday afternoon, he'd, after qualifying, he'd be off in the golf course with uh, Jacques Lafitte. Whereas Ayrton would be locked in the truck with the Honda engineers trying to work out how he could make the engine response better or, or more drivable, etc. So it, it just started to bring things into a, a, a different level. Hello and welcome to F1 Beyond the Grid. I'm Tom Clarkson and this episode is truly special. Neil Oatley is one of F1's ultimate behind-the-scenes heroes. All the way back in the late 1970s, he race-engineered the first Grand Prix-winning Williams, and his genius car setups helped the team to its first world titles. At McLaren, winning was not just required, it was expected. After all, the team won every race but one in 1988. In 89, Neil had a front-row seat as intra-team tensions boiled over, and in the following decade, he delivered huge success. Senna, Prost and Mika Hakkinen all won world titles in cars that he designed. And incredibly, Neil is still at the cutting edge of F1. As McLaren's Director of Design and Development, his world-beating wisdom helps to create the cars driven by Norris and Piastri today. Neil's unassuming, he doesn't like to shout about his achievements, but he talks me through the most memorable highlights from his stellar career. He explains how the sport has evolved for both driver and engineer during his time. Plus, you won't want to miss his fascinating insight into what it was like to witness firsthand Prost and Senna's intense rivalry. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Well, Neil, 45 years in the business and you're still at the coalface with McLaren. You're an unstoppable force. Yeah, it's still very enjoyable. You know, I still love, love the sport and it's great to still be able to have some involvement. Well, tell us about 2023, actually, because it's been reported in the media that you're actually, you really are back working on the MCL 60. What, what's the job? To be honest, it's only a very part-time job, so I've still got a number of other roles which, which I'm doing. So this is only just a small part of my time, really. But it's just to help mentor and take the load off some of the other key players in the restructured organisations, so Andrea, Neil, Peter and, and David, when, when he arrives later at the end of this year. Just trying to help where I can without um, being oppressive in, in my involvement. With so much experience, just give us your thoughts on the 2023 cars, because if we take Red Bull and Aston Martin actually out of the equation, we're seeing huge fluctuations in performance from race to race across the rest of the grid. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I think the two cars you mentioned are, are fairly neutral cars and they, they, they don't have many bad points, whereas I think the rest of us have got small problems with cars being inconsistent from different types of corner to another, different speeds. Modern Formula 1 cars are incredibly difficult to drive. They're, they're very sensitive to steering, right heights, etc. And um, some people have got the equation exactly right and others are still struggling a little bit. And, and actually, you talk about driving. would love to get your thoughts on... Lando Norris, Oscar Piastri. You've worked with so many drivers, many of which we're going to come to in a minute. But what are your thoughts on Lando and Oscar? 
I mean, they're both wonderful kids, really. I mean, I'm calling them kids because I'm, I'm so old myself. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think they've, they've both grown up through motorsport for a, a long period of their lives, and they're very attuned to what the modern driver has to do. Is much more of a scientist than the drivers were 45 years ago. So um, their ability to pick up on data, learn from it, be able to properly adjust themselves to try and make the best out of the equipment they've got in front of them. Neil, that's fascinating how the job of being a racing driver has changed since 1977 when you first joined Williams. What do you mean by them more scientific now? I couldn't imagine Alan Jones spending hours in the evening pouring over <laughs> the data from the day's running or, or even sitting in a, in a simulator. So it's a different type of application and a different mindset, I think, of the drivers. But the modern guys, and particularly the younger ones like uh, Lando and Oscar, that's all they've known. It's been there right from the beginning of their motorsport careers. And uh, they're able to adapt, play with their gaming stations and, and what have you, and, and, and use our simulator to improve their, their techniques and optimise what they've got. But do you think a fast racing driver is a fast racing driver across all eras? So could Lando be quick in an FW07 equally? Could Carlos Reutemann or, or Alan Jones be quick in a modern car with enough practice? I'm not sure, to be honest. I think the, the individuals are very different characters. I think the skill sets aren't the same, so it may not naturally translate across such a wide period of time. Okay, so if the drivers don't translate, what about the job of making a car go fast, right? I mean, you know, you have experience of ground effect from 40 years ago. How applicable is that on these modern cars? It, it's very addictive, I think, in the ground effect. Um, days back in the uh, late 70s and early 80s we had sliding skirts or fixed length skirts that allowed you to make more more changes more easily and they produce a phenomenal amount of downforce but a development would make a half a single lap difference now you're making half a tenth (laughs) difference on the development so it's it's a whole whole different ball game really and and it's very good for aerodynamicists to be able to have the freedom to develop their own ideas and, and apply them to a car almost straight away so is modern F1 more evolution rather than revolution? Very much so. There's a huge amount of work goes on in CFD and in the wind tunnels to chip away at very, very small differences and understand them, whereas it was big chunks <laughs> uh, back in, the, in that, all that time ago. Now, Neil, you've been a race engineer, you've been a designer. There isn't a bit of a racing car that you don't know after your experience in the sport. What would you say has been your particular area of expertise i'm more of a mechanical engineer than a aerodynamicist and that's really how my education and early career evolved i think so having more time again i might have taken a different route from what i know now but i think that's sort of served me reasonably well and um, i've been lucky enough to be surrounded by so many good people good engineers that it's um, it all rubs off on you and you you're able to absorb the knowledge from the other people have gained and uh, apply it yourself so I've shared the room with a lot of very talented people. You certainly have. But what about your own motivation? Is it born out of a desire to win? Is it born out of a desire to find new avenues? Yeah, I think everyone in the sport has got a strong desire to win. I mean, losing's really awful. <laughs> in fact, that, that plays on your mind more than the wins do, I think. A win, you, know, you put it away and it's the next day you've forgotten about it, but the, the losses are actually, are actually far more more important than and learning from them and, and going forwards. I mean, I started off as a young kid who was, loved racing cars and it's, my career sort of followed a pre-planned path, which um, not many people are lucky enough to have um, had happened to them. You've won nine driver's titles, seven constructor's titles. What means more to you, a driver winning the championship or the team winning the championship? I think that's very blurred. I think everyone remembers who won the Drivers' Championship and very few people remember who won the Constructors' Championship. I think the politically correct thing to say would be the Constructors' Championship, but I think that in reality that's not really the case. And I think you need your, your, your driver to win the, the Drivers' Championship and that's really the most important thing. Except, Neil, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I beg to differ because Frank and Patrick always told us in the media anyway that the Constructors' Championship is where it was at. And I think some of the drivers, like Damon, will tell you, yeah, he sort of felt that the team championship was more important to them as well. I think if you ask that, Patrick, to be honest now, he'd say the same as what I did. (laughs) Okay. 
I'm, I'm slightly guessing there. Let's now wind it back and have a look at your career in detail. And we're going to go back to the beginning, to 1977. You join Williams. I think you're employee number 13, if I've got that right. That's correct, yeah. Patrick Head was your first technical boss. How instrumental was he? How influential was he on you? Oh, tremendous this so. I mean, I'd, I'd have to say, although my career to Patrick and, and Frank as well, I mean, both fairly mercurial characters, but um, when I joined Williams, Patrick was the only other engineer there, and I was a fairly short time out of university and very green in, in engineering terms, and I just learned so much from him, and he was such a good mentor and a superb person to work from, and, and I, I couldn't have landed in a better place, I think, to um, develop myself as a person and, and an engineer. What was the biggest thing Patrick taught you? Making a practical car, but a fast car, and joining those things together. I think the FW07 was a good example of that. I mean, it, it really took on the ideas of the Lotus 79, particularly, Lotus 78 slightly, but engineered it in a much better way, so it's more successful, and I think, um, when everyone caught up with Lotus in 1979, the deficiencies of their car, because it just wasn't very nicely engineered, became fairly evident and then people overtook them and made much faster vehicles. And how quickly did Patrick give you responsibility in the design office? Fairly quickly, because he had no other choice. <laughs> <laughs> Needs must. Yeah, I mean, Frank Durney arrived um, after a year or so, a year and a quarter perhaps, um, uh, to boost the office. But um, no, it was a fantastic period to learn that the FW06, which was just being started when I arrived, was a relatively simple car. It was a typical mid-70s vehicle. But um, I mean, I, I joined in early September and the car was running in December. And that, that was from nothing because they were running a March 761 prior to that. So there was not much around when we used the March wing, probably, and, and things like that. But it, it all came together very quickly and um, super place to learn. And talking about the aerodynamics of the FW07, how much time were you spending in the wind tunnel and how much of it was just on a drawing board? Very little wind tunnel time. I think the FW6 never went in the wind tunnel until we actually started to develop the, as a baseline for the FW07. But we used the Imperial College wind tunnel in London. And I think we went there maybe once a month for a few days. And that slowly increased. Then we bought the wind tunnel from Specialised Mouldings up in Huntingdon and installed that in another building in, in Didcot. And uh, actually Ross Braun was responsible for the <laughs> installation of that. And, and that allowed us to sort of test all the time in-house. So that, that was a big step forward. I find it fascinating when you say the FW06 didn't go in a wind tunnel. So how do you decide upon the shape of the car? I mean, that's all Patrick's work, and it was his intuition, really, and what he'd learnt through his brief phrase with uh, Wolf, which was fairly short, but they, at Lola prior to that, and he designed a Formula 2 car for Richard Scott and a Formula 4000 car for Delta. So he'd been absorbing that knowledge and, and learning from what other people were doing. But how interesting that... 06 didn't go in the wind tunnel. 07 did. Yes, and it looked a bit different. But actually, Patrick's gut direction of how to make the car look wasn't wrong. No, it, it, was, it was perfect. We did initial test at uh, Donington. And it had a few slight quirks going over brows. And Patrick thought he'd sort of screwed it up. But in fact, he hadn't. And it, <laughs> it just took a little bit of tuning to, to get the car right. And it was, and it was very quick straight away. But, I mean, unfortunately, it arrived a few races into the season and was a little bit unreliable for the first couple of events. So I think if we'd got it ready a little bit earlier, it probably would have won the championship because it was certainly a lot better car than the Ferrari was that year. Well, I was going to ask you about that. So the wins start coming at Silverstone in 1979. You are, as well as doing everything in the design, or not everything, but working in the design office, you are race engineering Clay Regazzoni. It's the first of Williams' 114 wins. What are your memories of that Silverstone weekend? It was a great day, particularly for Frank, who had been trying for such a long time. It's probably the only time in my life I ever saw him drink any alcohol or smoke a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> the car had been very quick in testing. We'd, um, uh, Frank had come up with some different aerodynamic pieces in the pre-Grand Prix test, and then the car had made, made a big step forward. Also, we we traditionally viewed Silverstone as a high-speed, low-downfall circuit, so we were running small wings, but we actually tried putting them 
a, a bit, slightly bigger wing on in the test, and that suddenly made the car really come alive. So a lot of the performance gain was with the wing, wing working better in reaction to the, the underwing of the car. So the, the car was, was pretty special by the time we raced at Silverstone, but we were up against the turbo cars, who were obviously very quick. Because those days you didn't have TV monitors on the screen, I, I didn't actually realise that Clay had actually led half of the first lap <laughs> until I saw it a few years ago. Because you know, just you were never aware of that thing. But um, we were slightly fortunate because some of the turbo cars had unreliability, and uh, obviously Alan was, was actually um, competing very well, but but had a small crack in a water pump, and which leaked all the water out and lost him the race basically. So, and how nervous were you at that point that Clay wasn't going to make it to the end? I'm always nervous in races. I think it's always a terrible situation when you're leading the race by a long way and all you, all you think about is what could go wrong. <laughs> and, and again, because you didn't have TVs, you have to, had to wait until the car came into view every lap and to know it was still running. But it was uh, leading quite comfortably for over half the race, I think. And it, it, So it was, a, it was a long day, actually. His last few laps took a long time to happen. Obviously, it gave Frank the credibility that he'd been craving for the last sort of 10 years but how did you feel about that win glad it happened but i think you only remember the, the wins in a small way and you remember the losses that uh, really ease away at you so I, I think you know the next day it's you're moving on to the next thing so it doesn't really stay with you for that so long but it was the start if you like of an incredible end of the year i think you won five of the last seven races as a team how did that change the atmosphere inside Williams? A lot. And as you say, Frank had been struggling from 1969 to actually put together a really good uh, racing team in the season. And suddenly we became the team to beat. And over a very short that almost happened within 12 months. It, it, it went from almost nothing to an incredibly successful team. So it really did boil up everyone. It made it easier to recruit people. And, uh, and the team expanded quite rapidly after that um, allowed us to get sponsors most importantly to much more easily um, obviously Mansur OJ came on board in, in that period and uh, yeah it was a, it was a wonderful time to sort of very rapid expansion and, and, and it was all handled very well I think it, it, it was very easy to lose um, sense of yourself if, if you're expanding too quickly but it was all done in a very appropriate way I think and, and we moved forward and how much confidence did you have going into 1980, having had that domination, I think we can call it, of the second half of 79? I think we were very confident. Obviously, you're always worried that other people will quickly catch up. And obviously, that it was fairly competitive that year. But Alan was on, on the top of his form. Carlos joined the team that year. And we had a sort of very strong pairing between the two of them for those following two years. The FW07 ended up doing three seasons how did you tweak it from one to the next i think 79 to 80 was a sort of an evolution we no, it wasn't a, a massive change obviously there were some regulation changes for um 81 which got a bit complicated um, with the um right height rules and uh, and so on and how people were bypassing them so that was, that was probably more significant change for 81 also, we had a fairly unusual step where we switched from Goodyear, or some Michelin to Goodyear tyres in, in mid-season, which would be unthinkable now. <laughs> Why did you do that? That seems an extraordinary thing. Frank was a big fan of the USA and, and American business, and, and he thought American muscle would, would prevail over the small French <laughs> company from Clermont. And, uh, and that did cause us some problems. I think we... The tyres had very different characteristics and we, we didn't respond probably as quickly as Braddon did in adjusting the car to suit the different tyres. Carlos was completely dismayed by the change and uh, I think if you look back, he scored probably three quarters of his points in the, with the Michelin car then <laughs> compared to the Goodyear car. We'll be back with Neil shortly, but first, here's something that will interest you if you're into cryptocurrency or have ever thought about it. If you've ever wondered how to actually get hold of the money you put into your digital account, MoneyGram can help. They've got an easy and convenient way of helping you turn your crypto into real cash. There are MoneyGram locations all over the world, and at many of them, you can take money out of select digital wallets and you can put money in as well. You don't need a bank credit card or debit card to do it either. So if you are unsure about how to get access to the money you have in your online accounts, MoneyGram has the answer. Just visit a participating MoneyGram location and with select digital wallets, you can convert your cryptocurrency to cash and back again. 
Flex your finances using the only digital wallets with real cash access, activated by MoneyGram. Learn more at moneygram.com forward slash Stellar Wallets. That's moneygram.com slash Stellar Wallets. The chicken flag holder is out. I can see the flag of Saudi and the British Union Jack. And Alan Jones takes that Union Jack to win the Caesars Palace Grand Prix. So there is the world champion actually becoming world champion of 1981. Fifth position, Nelson Piquet, ahead of Carlos Reutemann. The end of an exciting and well worth it Caesars Palace Grand Prix of 1981. Las Vegas 81. I did want to ask you about this race. It's the season decider. Carlos goes into the race at Caesars Palace, one point in the lead of the World Championship. He qualifies on pole, yet he finishes eighth. PK wins the championship by a point. What happened there? <laughs> what happened in that race? I'm glad you brought up that pain. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there will be lots of good moments later on. I mean, the championship's never won or lost on one race, but obviously that, that is the focal point of that, that season. As you say, the car was quick in practice. Carlos qualified on pole. In warm-up on, on Sunday, we had a problem with his race car. The engine was had a very slight misfire, and we couldn't actually find out what was causing that, so we, we felt it was too big a risk to race that engine, and, and we didn't feel we had enough time to properly swap the engines over. So he, he went into his T-car, which he'd used during the... Um, it was actually three days of practice that, that year. And he was never quite as comfortable in the T-car as he was in the race car. I mean, we weren't as adept at making all the cars the same as we are would be now and in, in, back in, in that time so the t car wasn't as good a car as the race car for whatever reason uh, unknown Carlos said the gear shift was, was bad but we honestly we, we stripped it down couldn't find anything wrong there's no damage to the gear so i i, I don't know and uh, we set up the car it was, it was my fault entirely fairly stiff and which was just quick on a one lap in practice and it may have been an error and then not been quick for the whole grand prix length so that all those factors together Carlos may have, you know, the, his crowning glory was there for grabbing and sometimes people do choke a little bit. I don't, I don't know. But, what um, was his mood at lunchtime on Sunday? Not good. Yeah. I, <laughs> no, he was very unconfident. That he was convinced everything was to go wrong and, and sure enough it did. But, <laughs> but So Neil, even back then, you know, I'm told by race engineers now that part of their job is, is not, they're not psychologists, but working with the drivers, helping them feel confident. Were you having to do that that day with Carlos? I was trying to, and I think looking back, I probably didn't do a very good job of it. And, uh, and I, you know, I'd take more of the blame than Carlos for it, for not winning in that, that event. It, um, you know, is, is a night, recurring nightmare really. But I think when you look back, you always think of things you could have done better. And, and uh, I, th I think as a team, we didn't massage it. He was, a, you know, he's a Frank and Patrick were definitely not people for um, putting their arm around drivers and trying to make them feel better. And, that, and that, that's what Carlos needed. I think he was always convinced that Frank and Patrick didn't want him to win and would much prefer Alan taking the laurels at all the races, so, which was far from the truth. So I think all those things combined together just tipped the things scales in the wrong way on that day. What was Carlos's greatest strength as a driver? He was tremendously quick when everything was, was pointing in the right direction. He thought about racing a lot, and I think going back to an earlier question, he, he would have loved today <laughs> and, and having that data available. And if he was sat here today, sadly he isn't, um, he could probably tell you what gear race he was running at <laughs> every track. And uh, but he used to do some strange things, like um, he'd go out for on a Friday practice, and uh, he'd be running at twenty seconds, thirty seconds off the pace, and Patrick would be going absolutely livid and shouting at me on the pit wall. But what he would do is split the circuit into three sections drive flat out through the first section, then slow down, think about it while he's going around the rest of the lap, do it again, get it right, then move on to the next section, and then the third section. And then eventually on lap nine or ten, he would put it all together and do a blisteringly quick lap. So very strange character in many ways, but a lovely gentleman. So after the disappointment of Vegas, we go into 1982. Carlos is still at the team. He finishes on the podium at the first race of that season. How surprised were you that he just gave it up after two races and retired? I mean, it came completely out of the blue to me. Um, there was no mention of it at the racetrack? No, absolutely none. And you no. felt that he was still as committed and as quick in the car? Yeah, and he, was, he was very quick. I mean, obviously, um, Kaki joined the team that year and was very quick. 
Kirk had tremendous car control, so his athletic ability to drive a car quickly was was tremendous. And maybe Carlos was put off by that and thinking that Keke would become another Alan Jones as <laughs> Frank and Baxter's favourite in his, in his in his mind. So I, I don't know. I didn't really see him after he, he retired and for many many years. Carlos drove the Ferrari at the Argentine Grand Prix in the mid nineties. I can't remember exactly which year. Maybe it was ninety five. I'm guessing. Yeah, oh, yeah, I was there. And it yeah, was yeah, wet. Yeah, yeah. And he got in it and gave it full beans straight away. I was incredibly impressed. Yeah, no, he wasn't that far off the pace yeah. of, of the, the actual race drivers, and I think, and uh, he'd been in the garage sort of going through all my notes of, <laughs> of how you... <laughs> <laughs> no, what, what gear they were using on each corner and, and such like, so he could apply that in the, when he drove the Ferrari. So, yeah. Now, Neil, I know that Alan Jones was, was predominantly on the other side of the garage, but the teams were so small back then. I'm sure you got a feel for what Jonesy was doing that was impressive. And of course, you then worked with him at Beatrice a few years later. What was it about Alan Jones that made him so impressive? I mean, he was an incredibly tough racer. You know, he wouldn't, uh, wouldn't take any prisoners on the circuit, as probably Nelson found out a couple of times. Yeah, he was a tremendous racer. He'd just report back exactly what the car was doing, and then that's your problem. Sort it out, and I'll, he'll go away and do something else. And so he was very, very straightforward. His ability to drive were quite physical cars at that time. Though they were producing a lot of downforce, you need to be fairly strong to even just sort of turn the wheel at, in, in the high-speed corners. So I think those cars suited him. He was brave, which again, and you had to have a commitment to drive the car very quickly. So I think that time and that period of car absolutely suited his personality and abilities. How had he changed as a driver, if at all, by the time you then worked together at Beatrice? Yeah, I'm not sure if it was really the best idea to come back. I think in the first place he retired too early. I think he he sort of exhausted himself after 81 and, and just didn't want to go through it all again. And uh, I think he got fed up with grey, miserable days in Putney <laughs> rather than the sort of sunny uh, climbs down under. So, But I think he, he would have been better if he just stayed on another couple of years and then made a cleaner break of it. It was certainly reported in the media that Jones and Reutemann were bickering, they weren't getting on. Do you think he found that exhausting as well? No, I, I think it's water off a duck's back to him. He, he, I mean, after Brazil in 81, he, he didn't really take any notice of Carlos. <laughs> there wasn't any bickering at all. I think that was obvious to me anyway. Yeah. And if there's one drive that stood out, either from Jones or Reutemann? There were many of them, I think... Um, one, one thing that sticks in my mind, which actually wasn't a race, but it was Carlos's qualifying lap in Monza in 1981. Yeah, in a DFE car against the turbos. And uh, no, the car was absolutely perfectly balanced. We'd, we'd actually done a test at Monza a couple of weeks beforehand. And uh, as it was August, the stands were full of uh, Italians on holiday. And, uh, but we, we were the only team there. So, and we did one, one day with each driver. And I had this massive list of things I wanted to try on the car. And uh, so we, we moved our pit to the pit entrance and Carlos would go out, do one time lap, hit the brakes, do a U-turn on the main straight, come back in the pit. We do the quick change and off we'd go. And we did that the whole day. So we probably saved about 30 laps, but we went through this matrix of different um, setups and um, honed in on something that was really good. So we ran a really minimum wing level and... Uh, the car was absolutely perfectly balanced, so it, and, and that translated directly to the race. But while we sat on the grid, it started to drizzle slightly, and, and that car was completely lost his confidence because <laughs> the car was actually on a knife edge, but he could control it in the drive, but he just wasn't comfortable in the uh, damp conditions. And uh, Alan, a couple of days before, had a fight with a transit driver in the Putney High Street, had broken his finger, <laughs> but he still managed to beat, beat Carlos in the race. So it, that was a good qualifying for the bad race. So look, final thoughts on Williams. How quickly was Formula One changing at this time in terms of how you were designing things back in 77 versus almost a decade later? Was the process different? And also, are there any particular innovations from that time that you're especially proud of? Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm proud of that much I've done, but, uh, but the process is evolved a lot obviously as we mentioned earlier the wind tunnels became more more of a force and, and at williams we had our own one that made a big difference to do things in-house data didn't really it started becoming important during the turbo era mainly for engine data and it probably wasn't until 
early 90s that we started to do a lot of data recording for chassis sides and that, and that opened up sort of new avenues of learning about the car and correlating the aerodynamic um, performance on the track compared to what we we're looking at in the wind tunnel and it's all moved on a lot now with CFD and what have you so why do you think it worked so well between Frank and Patrick I mean they were very different but very matched characters and I think they had their strong points and weak points complemented one another so it became an entity <laughs> that was able to drive that that team along and it's it was, it was in the days where the teams were still quite small so the two individuals would have a far more effect than perhaps they would do nowadays and they're both fantastic people to work with I mean they're both such a big influence on, on my life really from all that time ago. What was Patrick's reaction when you said to him I've loved my time here but I'm actually moving to a what is effectively a start-up Formula One team in Beatrice? Yes, it was, and it, it, um, he was very disappointed, to say the least, but um, I think he could understand it. I mean, my, my motivation was that I'd, I'd learned a huge amount from Patrick and, and did feel get very guilty about taking that knowledge away with me, but, um, but I felt I'd sort of worked with him for such a long time and learned so much that I wasn't sure about my own abilities and I wanted to just prove whether I could work without that safety net of, of Patrick standing over me, being able to correct any silly errors <laughs> or, or bad decisions I made. So. so tell us about the team. So Carl Haas, an Indy car, North American racing legend, wanted to come and do Formula One. He had a good sponsor in Beatrice. He had Ford on board. And when you think of the talent that he had in that team, and I'm thinking of you, I'm thinking of Ross Braun. I know Adrian Newey came on a little bit later. You had Alan Jones driving one of the cars. On paper, it looked unstoppable. What was the reality? It had the base of a very good team. Obviously, as you say, it was starting from scratch or evolved out of the Maya Motor Racing uh, IndyCar team, which uh, Teddy and Tyler had, had been running. Um, had quite a few old McLaren people from the 70s who so were very experienced and um, all very good people at their own in their own areas. And uh, I think if we'd had a, another year, I think it would have all come together, but um, we, we struggled a bit. The Cosworth engine was was new for that year, and that was still a learning process, and uh, I think it wasn't particularly powerful or advanced as some of the other teams to start with. And it, I think by August, I think Ford had decided that they'd rather give the engine to Bennett in the following year, which is part of the reason why it, it fell over. And um, so he didn't really evolve very much with us. Um, I remember they, they let Patrick have a special engine at, in, in morning warm-up at uh, Monza, which had a lot, lot more capable of running a lot more boost, and he was like, 50 miles an hour quicker than Alan, <laughs> and, and very quick, but then, then it blew up <laughs> before the end of warm-up, so it wasn't actually raced, and uh, then that was the last we saw of it, so... Alan wasn't shy at criticising either Ford or Cosworth, and it, you know, I think the whole thing sort of spiralled a bit. Uh, and then Beatrice disappeared, and, and Carl wasn't that committed to keeping the F1 team going. How frustrating was all that for you? Very exciting. I think it, you know, there's a lot of really good people there, and you say Adrian had arrived probably in July or August of that year, so he was already working on a, on a design for the following year's car. Do you think the writing was already on the wall at that point, though, that, that actually it was dead in the water for the next year? It was looking a little bit, I think by September it became obvious that it wasn't going to be straightforward if we'd carry on or not, and, and it fairly quickly disappeared. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, when we got back from Australia, it was <laughs> locking the door and <laughs> going off to past is new. And Neil, what were you thinking at this point in terms of your career and what to do next? Yeah, I hadn't really thought about it until things started getting looking a bit um, dodgy, and uh, almost by incredible coincidence, it was, I got an approach from McLaren almost exactly the same time, so there wasn't really a long period where I was really wondering what the hell I was going to do in the futures. The commitment to stay in motorsport, you didn't want to suddenly start designing road cars. You knew that you wanted to stay in Formula One, and or, or was it, did you consider a move to IndyCar? Or? No, Formula One's always been my primary uh, love of in racing and um, yeah and, and competition cars of, of, of really where, where I've always wanted, wanted to do I, I didn't really have any desires to work in road cars or or such like so luckily things have <laughs> allowed me to do that for uh, quite a long period of time this episode is sponsored by athletic greens their ag1 nutritional drink has become part of my routine I started taking it because I needed a reliable multivitamin that could help keep my energy levels steady and my immune system strong. 
And as you know, I travel a lot. And one of my biggest fears is feeling under the weather when I'm away from home. That's why I'm always keen to fuel my body in the best way possible. Race weekends are pretty busy with interviews, press conferences and loads more to do. But AG1 is so easy to take. I just put one scoop of AG1 into a glass of water and it gives me 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics and adaptogens. It feels like I'm doing something good for my body and it's made of only the best ingredients. You won't find any nasty chemicals or artificial stuff in here. It contains less than one gram of sugar and it tastes nice as well, which isn't always the case with these things. And better still, it's cheaper than buying all of your supplements separately. Not only has AG1 kept me feeling good while traveling, it's got a ton of other benefits as well. It helps to support gut health and the nervous system. It helps with sleep, recovery after exercise, and can help sharpen your focus if you ever suffer from brain fog. Adding AG1 to your daily routine couldn't be simpler. Just take it in the morning when you wake up or mix it in your water for when you leave the gym. It's a small micro habit with big benefits. And just one thing you can do every single day to take great care of yourself. So reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. If you want to take ownership of your health, today is a good time to start. Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com forward slash F1BTG. That's athleticgreens.com slash F1BTG. Check it out. So you get an offer from McLaren and it seems that Ron Dennis was building a bit of a super team back then because you join at what seemed to be roughly the same time as Gordon Murray. Ron was desperately trying to lure Ayrton Senna to the team to join Alain Prost. It must have felt a really exciting place to be when you first turned up in Woking. To be honest, at the time I didn't know that Gordon was, was coming to the team. I was actually agreed with um, Ron some terms and I actually went round to his house to, to sign the contract and, uh, and Gordon opened the door. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my first inkling. <laughs> oh, wow, really? I didn't realise that. Okay. Anyway, things carried on and um, the team was obviously very good. I mean, John Barnard had obviously departed just prior to that and uh, but the, the team of guys that were already here were, were tremendously talented individuals and uh, that was a really strong Small team, but a really strong engineering team. And how did you rub along with the Gordon Murrays and the Steve Nichols? Very well. I didn't really have any problems with any of them. I, I mean, I've, all the guys that were here were sort of very straightforward characters. There was no sort of big egos in the way. We were just building the um, what was then the new factory in, in Woking to move into. And Gordon was reasonably preoccupied with, with sorting that, that out. So the rest of us engineers were sort of left very much to their own devices. And in fact, for the first three months, three or four months I was there, we were working in the very old McLaren factory and everybody else was in the new one. So we had to sort of do a half mile trip to, <laughs> to, sc- to speak to anyone else. But it, it all worked out quite well, I think. And so which was the first car that you started working on? It would have been MP4-3. I mean, that, that was primarily... I was well advanced by the time I got there, so I only did a few trivial bits and pieces for it, to be honest. And uh, my role was going to be working on the first V10 Honda car. So, um, so I left Steve <laughs> and uh, carry on with what, what he was doing. So in the design office, you were focused on MP45 for 1989, but then practically at the track, you were race engineering Alain Prost. Have I got that right? Yeah, so um, you could do a day job on the drawing board and then go off for the weekend <laughs> being a race engineer and then come back on Monday morning and carry on with the design work. So it's, it, that's really exactly how it, how it worked. And uh, so Steve kept on developing the MP43 and MP44 while I was working on the... We did the test car for the V10 and then, then the proper race car for the following season. We'll come on to the 89 car, but can we talk about that 88 season, that incredible year where... McLaren won all but one race and Senna and Prost were hammer and tongs every weekend. What was it like to be in the garage at that time working with Alain? It was good. I mean, there wasn't 
really a lot of attention, particularly in 88. That was fairly uh, friendly atmosphere. Obviously, it changed a little bit uh, after Imola in 89. But I'd, I'd worked with Alan the previous year on the MP43. And literally the first time I ever met Alan was actually for the Brazilian Grand Prix that year. We, the flight was delayed going out there, so we didn't arrive until Thursday night. So I, the first time I met him was actually... <laughs> Almost just, on the just before P1. <laughs> um, anyway, just going on the side. But, um, Alain Prost was known as Le Professor. You know, having worked with him, did he warrant that? What Was he incredibly detailed in the technical side of things? Obviously, he learned a lot, I think, from Nicky in the couple of years together. Alain was very focused on, on making a good racing car rather than a good qualifying car. So he, everyone likes to be on pole position, but that wasn't so important to him. And he was just focused on getting a good race car. I mean, it's very interesting that in mean, that first year, the whole team was very much focused on, on Alan. And, in 87, yeah, right? 87, yeah. yeah. And Stefan was sort of over there somewhere. <laughs> when Ayrton arrived in 88, you could notice a big shift and then suddenly it was just me plugged into <laughs> to, to Alan. So there was a, the, the team had always decided, I think, where their future lay oh, as early as that. How early in that 88 season did you realise you had a rocket ship? The first run the car did on the track, I think it. it um, I, I was at Imola with the MP43, but which we converted to run Honda engines. So we'd been doing two or three days with both Ayrton and Alan, and the, the MP44 was very late getting finished, and it, it literally arrived the night before the last day of the test. So it, it only had one day's testing before we went to Brazil. But the first, we well, did the installation lap, and then the first proper run, it was probably at least the second half quicker than the old car had been. It may have been two seconds, so it, it was just instantly, it was just so much faster than the old car. Who drove it first? Alan, and then, yeah, there was a bit of argument about who. <laughs> I think Alan was convinced that he should focus on that car on the whole day and there and just drive it in Brazil. But, but anyway, they did half a day each. And it was a rocket ship from that moment. Can you remember what Prost's first words to you were when he got back to the pits? I think it was something like, oh, we can win the championship in this car, no problem. <laughs> Did he really say that? Yeah. Wow. And then what is it like to ride that crest of a wave where you go into every weekend knowing that you should win that Grand Prix? One of you. Yeah, I think as I mentioned earlier, you're in a race you're always worried about breaking down when you're in a really fairly invulnerable position. It's, um, that's the only concern, but I think we were lucky both that year and the year after we knew one of our two drivers was certainly going to win the world championship. So that created a sort of different dynamic than it would have been if we'd been in a, in a big fight with, with other teams as well. So it, things evolved quite differently, I think. You've been involved in so many championship battles over the years. What's harder for a team, an intra-team battle between your two drivers or an inter-team battle where one of your guys is fighting someone from another team? Well, I'd say definitely fighting another team because you're... It's your responsibility to make a vehicle that's capable of beating the opposition. And uh, the two drivers' setups rarely de deviated from one another because then it was basically fear, I think, that they would, if they took a different direction on setup and actually made it worse, then the other guy would get an advantage. So they were both, we were just tweaking little things on setup. It wasn't any big changes. And uh, all they were doing was looking across the garage at what the other guy was doing. So it, it, was, it was very different. You said a minute ago that Prost was more interested in having a good car for the race. But I did want to ask you about Portugal 88, where he was mighty, mighty in qualifying. And tell me if I'm wrong, but I think he got changed into his jeans mid-qualifying and then stood on the pit wall just to annoy Senna. Is that true? That's absolutely true, yeah. I mean, he was phenomenally quick and literally, I think, half an hour into the session, he did, went off to the truck got changed into his civvies and uh, just leant on the pit wall looking into Ayrton's garage. And <laughs> Beat that. Beat that. Which, of course, he didn't. But how good was that lap? Why was Prost so mighty that day? On his day, Alan could be very, very quick, but um, I think also Ayrton had a slight problem with his engine settings, so there may have been a slight detriment to the performance of uh, Ayrton's car, which helped, because like, um, there was a reasonable difference in Harath as well, not, but nothing like as it, as it was in Portugal. Yeah, and I think he just wanted to sort of touch his nose again <laughs> against that. And then, uh, yeah. Early in the race, Senna veers towards the pit wall with Prost on his right-hand side, almost putting Alan into the wall. Was that the first time you saw anything particularly aggressive between those two? 
Yeah, I think I think it was to be honest. It may have been partly as a result of what Alan did on <laughs> previous afternoon. To be honest, and yeah, I think I've been f- pretty am- amicable yeah up to that point, and then then that did create a little bit of tension, which obviously then bubbled over six months later so in, do, I mean, in Emily. Yeah. Do you think that was the first time it got awkward, and that I, I think so, yeah. Okay, and was Ron good at dealing with those two in those situations? He was. I think I was a major part of his working day he was <laughs> pacifying I'm keep, keeping them both um, happy and, and performing well it's something he sheltered the rest of the team from very well in fact and so we, we weren't really that that bothered but um, but obviously it did get a little bit more tense in in, in 89 and uh, I think from him onwards the drivers just didn't speak to each other So how did it work in the debriefs? Slightly weird I mean we'd be sitting around the table like we are now all, all of us both drivers myself Steve and Gordon and Tim Wright but the drivers would never speak to each other if, if Alan wanted to know something about Ayrton Scar he'd ask Steve and, <laughs> and if Ayrton wanted to know something he'd, he'd ask me and not, not Alan so it's, it's a slightly strange situation but, but not really any animosity evident in, the, in that situation And incredibly secretive not wanting to give away any, anything about performance to the other one no, it's, it was actually fairly open. I think, as I mentioned earlier, that the setups didn't really vary very much because they only really had to worry about the, the guy on the other side of the table. So, yeah, it was fairly open and there wasn't really anything underhand. Do you think Prost accepted that Senna was quicker than him over one lap? Never asked him that question, but I think my gut feeling is, is yes, and uh, but it didn't really bother him. And obviously they were half a generation apart, so Alan had done, done his bit and was a lot further in, in, in his career. And Ayrton was wanted to prove that he was the fastest driver ever, probably. <laughs> and uh, but it's not something that really played on Anna's mind, I don't think. How much did Senna winning that title in 88 play on Prost's mind? I wasn't actually at those last couple of races in 88 because I was working on the race car for the following year. So it, it, the, the immediate aftermath of it, I'm, I'm not sure. On balance over the whole of 88, Ayrton probably did have the upper hand over Alan, he obviously had a couple of reliability problems, which cost him perhaps more than an Alan lost through failures. But um, uh, and in the race in '88, uh, Alan had a problem with his gearbox, so he, he was struggling a little bit, and and and, and Ayrton was was obviously on top form <laughs> that day, as he normally was. Yeah, he was blistering. So he wins the title in '88. Senna does. We come into '89. Your car, MP45, Honda. Because the regulations changed, the turbo's gone, a V10 comes in. How good was the engine, first of all? It was pretty good. It, um, obviously, we'd done quite a lot of testing over the six months in the second half of, of 88, so we'd, the reliability was good. And, and it was very strong. It was probably the best engine in the field. Really, from day one? Certainly from the beginning of the racing season, so that was an advantage for us. Is it true that McLaren sent a chassis to Suzuka and the likes of Alan McNish and, and Emanuele Pirro were pounding around Suzuka with the V10? Oh yeah, and the, the turbo as well previously, so we'd, as soon as we signed the contract with Honda, we'd, we'd had a, effectively had a test team in, in Japan for all the years of the Honda contract, and so it was running perhaps once a month, roughly or every six weeks, so you know, they probably do eight, ten tests there a year uh, on all the engines, so they'd be running development for the current year and for next year as well, which was, again, a big advantage for the engine side of us. It wasn't a huge benefit for the, from the chassis side, but for the engine it was performance, reliability, etc. It was, was a good thing to have available to us. So the engine's good, the car is clearly good because you win lots of races, but how did you feel personally coming into 1989 on the back of such a hugely successful season this is your baby Neil <laughs> did you feel pressure oh tremendous amount I mean, not not because anyone was putting it on me but within myself I, I thought how the hell am I going <laughs> to repeat what we did last year and it, obviously it all came crushing down in the first race because Ayrton had an accident on the first or second corner Alan had a problem with the clutch hydraulic pipe at broken away from its mounting and was lying on the exhaust pipe so it boiled all the clutch fluid so we effectively didn't have a clutch and even in those days when tyre deg wasn't so huge Brazil was because of the sort of nature of the tarmac which had lots of seashells in it I think it was very abrasive and, and you, you got high deg so it, even then you had to do a one or two stop race which was unusual for that period in time and 
and as tyres were you know, going off and off, and we kept yelling, <laughs> screaming on the radio to come in with what we planned to do, was just track the car up, give the boot full of revs, and we just drop it off the jack so we could take it off. But he, he didn't believe that would work, so he just refused to come in, so he just did the whole race on one set of tyres. And so we obviously dropped down a few positions. So, you know, he, sh- he should have won if the clutch had been working, but we didn't. So... And of course, Mansell, Nigel Mansell, completes his first race distance in that Ferrari to win the race. But you must have been confident, though. You'd seen enough performance from the car in that race. We did. Obviously, the, the Ferrari was reasonably competitive as well. The, as you say, it had a lot of reliability problems, but they obviously come on top of those. So on some circuits, they were good, but not, not consistently. Uh, Williams was good, again, on some circuits, but not others. So I think we were, our car was reasonably good for most locations that we raced on that, that year. And after Imola, after the deal that they weren't going to overtake each other before the first corner, and Prost felt that Senna had overtaken him unfairly. Yeah, I think there was a lack of agreement as to what, whether Tosser was the first corner or, uh, <laughs> or Tamburello or the, or the one that comes after that, I can't remember what it's called, but Villeneuve, I think. And, um, yeah, so that, that was really the... Did you ever worry that when they started to not talk to each other and their relationship became an issue, did you worry that this rivalry could end up losing you the championship? Not really, because I think they, generally they both behave themselves on the, on the circuit. Obviously, Pat Suzuka was a slight um, negative to that comment. But, uh... This is the opportunity that Senna's looking for, and he's going through. Out! Oh, my goodness! This is fantastic! They beat... This is what we were fearing might happen during the race. And that means to say that Prost has won the World Championship. Alain Prost, World Champion of 1989. The problem with Ayrton, he can't accept not to win and he can't accept that uh, somebody resists by uh, an overtaking manoeuvre. And uh, I learned a lot this year, especially on the human side. But uh, to be very honest, I mean, I'm quite happy to leave because I think it's, uh, it becomes absolutely impossible to work with Ayrton and uh, that's a good end of championship. So Suzuka, they're coming into the chicane. If you haven't seen it, have a look on YouTube. And Senna dives down the inside of Alain to try and go for the lead of the race and they end up colliding, Prost's out of the race, etc. What happened after the race there in terms of what internally? What were people at McLaren thinking about that accident? Yeah, I think to be honest... Probably I, I was an exception because I was working on his car, but um, I think the, the team, as I mentioned earlier, that sort of migrated across the garage to Ayrton's side really. And uh, obviously there was a lot of legal um, wranglings with the FIA and such like after that and whether Ayrton should have been disqualified or not. And the team were sort of trying very hard to make sure that Ayrton got that win back. I think directly after the race, I can't remember if I actually saw him because he, he didn't come back to the garage immediately, he went off to the uh, FIA stewards and was there for a long time. And obviously we normally we were off to the airport fairly soon after the race. So I don't think I actually saw him probably even until we got to um, Adelaide. But <laughs> yeah, I think the team really wanted Ayrton to win and carry the number one plate and the next year. Yeah. by this time in the season, you knew that Pross was off to Ferrari as well. I'm guessing that that's the worst place that he could have gone in the eyes of Ron Dennis, at least. Uh, that's a pretty true comment. I think, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, even Ferrari are very strong, and, and they were always a big rival to us. So, um, did you think of joining Ala in Maranello? I know Steve Nichols went with him. Did he try and take you as well? He did mention it to me, but I, I didn't really have the appetite to do that. I mean, I was very happy within the McLaren organisation and uh, thought ultimately we would, we would do a better job <laughs> than Marinello would. Well, as it panned out. But what, what must have been a really interesting journey for you is that you went from working with Prost, of course, still in the design office, you're still designing the cars. But in terms of what's happening at the racetrack, you then jump onto Senna's side of the garage. How welcoming was Ayrton? Ayrton was always very friendly, and he, I don't think he viewed me as a real, real enemy. And he was, he was just on the driver level. I think perhaps that. Oh, um, even when uh, Alan was at the team, yeah, he didn't exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. And how different was it working with Senna? Fair bit. I mean, also I'd, I'd done testing with him previously, but not not races. And uh, he was a lot more intense. He's playing over setups with the car and 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 also the engine um he he was taking things to a different level compared to what alan had been used to 
I mean, Adam was still in the mode where he'd, on a sort of Saturday afternoon, he'd, after qualifying, he'd, two hours later, he'd be off in the golf course with uh, Jacques Lafitte. Whereas Ed would be locked in the truck with the Honda engineers trying to work out how he could make the engine response better or, or more drivable, etc. So it, it just started to bring things into a, uh, a different level. Is it true that his power of recall was incredible? Very much so. I think like a lot of really top drivers, they, they drive incredibly quickly but still have a large percentage of their brain available to think about what they're doing and how they, how they can make the car faster and what it was doing at every moment on the circuit. Um, I think that perhaps came to a fore with the, um, the active ride car in, in 93 where we could tune it almost yard by yard <laughs> to suit the different um, attitudes that the car was taking in different corners, high speed, low speed, etc. And uh, Interesting that you mentioned that 93 car because the Formula One folklore would have you believe that the FW15C, the Williams of that year, was the most sophisticated car in the history of Formula One, etc., etc. But your active ride on that McLaren I read somewhere that you designed it in two or three months. Is that true? And how good was that car by the end of that year? Yeah, it was what you say on the time scale is absolutely true. And in fact, um, I think that year, Ron was convinced that Honda could be persuaded to carry on racing. So we, and we got to October and we honestly didn't know what engine we were going to fit in the car. So we were designing it, not knowing whether it's going to be a V8, V10 or V12. And the Cosworth deal, the full deal was done, I think, by the end of October. Fortunately, Cosworth had given us a few drawings <laughs> that we could start working on just prior to that. But um, that was one thing. And, and we'd, we'd had an active ride project with Honda running for a couple of years, but it was incredibly complicated, more akin to the Lotus and Williams systems. Then that disappeared, so we had to do something quickly. And w what we went for was just a, a, an active ride height control system, which was very, very simple. Pat Fry and... Giorgio Asconelli worked on that and uh, as you say it came together in two to three months and uh, was just ready in time to run on the car when it first ran at Silverstone in, at the beginning of 93. And you honed it and do you think in the second half of 93 you had the best car on the grid? Yeah I think we was obviously we won a couple of races in slightly unusual weather conditions at the beginning of the year but the car was still reasonably competitive but it was still quite a lot slower than the Williams. I mean, at Donington, it was a second half, two seconds off the pace in qualifying, but a bit, bit better in the race. But we still had a valve spring forward engine until the race after Hockenheim. And then we had the pneumatic valve spring engine, so that was a, quite a big step forward. But we, we kept tuning the chassis. The, the suspension system got more and more. The components were still very much the same, but how we used it became more complex. In Monza, we added power brakes, which was fairly novel, and that, that made quite a big difference to our performance. So I think by the time we got to the last couple of races in Japan and, and, and Australia, the car was as good as anything else on the grid, but the whole, the whole grid has all closed up quite a bit in, uh, by that time. How did Senna react to all of the developments you put on that car? Because, you know, Perhaps the fastest driver on the grid would want it to be as basic as possible, the formula, I mean, for him to show his brilliance. Did he welcome these developments or, or did he... Oh, yeah, yeah, very much so. And he, he, he loved playing with the suspension system with, with Pat and Giorgio and, um, and honing it to suit what he wanted the car to do at any moment on the circuit. So he used to spend hours working with it. The debriefs got even longer. Uh, and, and then they spent <laughs> hours and hours afterwards and... Uh, no, I think he loved all that. So he loved it, but do you think he thought Formula One was going in the wrong direction in terms of driver aids? I don't think so. I mean, I think it depends on what other people have had. <laughs> different, that's, a, that's one one downside is that different teams can accelerate their developments in, 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 in different areas. Um, perhaps traction control he wasn't so keen on when, if, uh, if that was more of a direct driver responsibility, if, if you like. And we also had the Lambo engine that year as well to, to play with as well. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Gosh, there was a lot going on at McLaren that time, wasn't there? Have you seen, Neil, a better opening lap of a Grand Prix than Senna at Donington in 93? No, that was pretty special. As I mentioned just now, we were some way off the pace in qualifying, but, but the rain's quite a good equaliser. It sort of null, nullifies some of the Renault advantage that Williams had at that time. And... Probably our suspension system, because it was a lot simpler, suited those conditions better and it could give the driver more feel 
was more feedback from the circuit of what the car was capable of doing. I mean, it was quite wet on that lap. I mean, I think it was the sun was actually shining on the grid, but then it started to terrain, and uh, I think everyone was a bit unsure of the actual grip level they had. Um, but Ayrton sussed it out <laughs> a lot better than most of the other drivers. And of all the drivers you've worked with in your career, give me your top three. Yeah, certainly Ed and Alan were exceptional. I think Mika, I, I think, is a little bit underrated in, in, in global terms. I think he was an exceptionally talented driver. Well, And he came in in Portugal 93, first race for the team, out-qualified Senna. I mean... What a wake-up call for Ayrton Senna, among many other things. Yeah, I don't think Ayrton was too impressed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he, in the race, he got his own back, and uh, and I think he sort of made sure that it didn't happen again in the uh, remaining two races of the year as well. But what stood out about Hacken, and it's really interesting you mention him, his raw speed. Yeah, it was that, the ability to drive a car quickly, but obviously in a Formula 1, that's not the only attribute you need to have. But he, he was incredibly um, receptive to different ideas to... To help him drive quicker if we sort of go ahead a few years for instance the brake steer system and he absolutely loved that and i think being realistic if if david had been our drive, only driver that we he would never actually got past the, <laughs> the first test but mika was able to just adapt his driving to suit the tools that you've given him so this is 1997 and there was an extra brake pedal in the footwell wasn't there just very quickly explain what it did yeah in in that year the the extra pedal, we, uh, it was Steve Nichols' idea, which I think he had lying in the bath one day. <laughs> and uh, it was connected to one or other of the rear brake calipers, depending on where the predominant corners were on, the, on any particular circuit. Um, so that basically allowed you to, once you come on the throttle, you could stamp on that, that pedal and it helped the car turn. So if you had a, you could set the car up with a sort of tendency to understeer, but that would overcome the understeer. So you could much better, some mid corner to exit speed and if you're trying to sort of fight an aero balance and uh, to get the, make the car quick so it's incredibly effective so around a track like silverstone what was it worth in terms of lap time we only tested it at silverstone so I, I, we never really did a back-to-back but i, I guess feeling was it was probably worth three tenths when we first did it and may have grown to five or six tenths as we got more used to it and for the beginning of the following year we developed an arrangement where you could switch it from one one side to the other, so it actually meant you could use it on every corner rather than rather than just one one hand of corner, which we had in Melbourne. Then it was sort of knocked on the head on <laughs> Thursday afternoon in Brazil, so that was the end of it. But though we didn't suddenly go backwards on the grid <laughs> when we took it off. So but but yeah. and Hakkinen would welcome those innovations. Yeah, and those sort of hand clutches and uh, and and such like, which we'd, we'd been playing with, and you know he, he loved doing something different and uh, and so he could left foot brake more easily as, as David didn't like left foot braking it took a long time to wean him <laughs> off to, to, to using both feet instead of just, just his right foot With Hakkinen did you notice any difference in terms of what he was capable of doing in a car pre and post his accident at Adelaide in 95? No to be honest it was fairly invisible I mean obviously it was a fairly serious incident and he was quite gravely injured and obviously he was fairly lucky to survive I think in, in, in reality Ron did a fantastic job at keeping him in cotton wool and, and slowly bringing him back in, into a position where he was fit and, and able to drive the car and it was a, a very um, low key test we did with him at Ricard just to make sure he, he could get back to his old self and I think that was fairly evident almost straight away that Nothing had really changed, and and then once we started testing properly, he was he was on it straight away. So no, he's such an inspirational character, isn't he? Even now, I love seeing him around the paddock. Yeah, he was a super nice guy, and he was a good human being. But he's, he was a fantastic racer. And in Miami this year, just seeing him talking to Jeff Bezos, he was <laughs> Mika was charged with showing Jeff Bezos around the paddock. You know, the the Amazon boss and. I could just, I was watching him and he was enthusing so much about Formula One. So he's been involved in F1 as a driver, is he now an ambassador and he still really loves it? Yeah, I think, I don't think he was ever a really sort of technical person, but he, he just loved the thrill and driving a racing car and, and being able to maximize what, what he could personally get out of it and, and relaying that back to the engineers to move on to the next step or help him to go that a little bit quicker. How much does it help you as an engineer to have a, a driver with a technical bent 
I mean, is it helpful if they start meddling with what to do with the car or, or do you actually just want basic feedback, leave the technical stuff to us? Probably at that time. It's, it's not something I'm particularly directly involved in or haven't been for some time now, but um, I think a driver just reporting what's happening um, and not trying to engineer the car himself is always preferable, I think, to, a, to any race engineer or, or designer. Yeah. Now, Neil, I've had you for so much time. It's been wonderful to talk to you. I did want to just run a couple more things past you. One is that I know some people listening to this will be fans of the DRS, the drag reduction system. There will be some people who are not fans of it saying it's, it's, it's a gimmick and, gosh, I wish it hadn't been introduced. And I think, Neil, tell me if I'm wrong, that the sport has McLaren to thank for the DRS system. And it all goes back to the F-duct of 2010. <laughs> Look, tell us about the F-Dot. What was it? Because, of course, the following year, the DRS system was introduced by the FIA. But how innovative was that F-Dot? Very. I mean, that came out of the blue. I mean, I think it, in, in the aero department, we've got a mad scientist <laughs> who <laughs> completely fits the bill, <laughs> if you were trying to think what, what that might be. But um, you know, he, he came up with the idea, and it was, it was a fairly complex system. I think obviously a lot of people did similar things during that season but I think don't think anyone actually twigs what what we were actually doing with it and uh, it, it was it was was very effective and I think it's worth probably 15 k's on the straight so stalling the rear wing is that yeah exactly mm. yeah so as you say it was very similar to in end result to what to what DRS did and, and, and is still doing but um you know it was, it was a great advantage for that car and obviously unlike DRS we could use it everywhere <laughs> Um, that we wanted to and it was it was very safe because it was just you know, it was a driver's elbow operating it and uh, you know, it was very simple I don't think we ever had any instances where they forgot about it and accidentally <laughs> <laughs> triggered it yeah. do you think in all your experience that so often Formula 1 at least from the outside looks an incredibly complicated sport but is it invariably the simple ideas that are often the most effective I think so. You say it's a very technical sport, but you still rely on the ingenuity of individuals to think of things that nobody else has done and gives you an advantage. And it's fantastic when it does happen. And of course, Lewis Hamilton was driving for you when the F duct uh, was on the car. Lots of fans of Lewis out there listening to this. How much did he love the technical side and, and welcoming new ideas like an F duct? Making use of any tools you give him, Lewis was very, very quick at being able to exploit them very well. Um, we, we had the F-duct on the car almost right from the, the get-go on, on that car in testing but it, it was a bit troublesome to get it to work properly initially so it, a lot of, there were a lot of late nights in Barcelona trying to get the thing working properly but one, once it worked, which was obviously prior to the first race it was, it was fantastic so there were some great engineers working on it very practical people and, and the driver being able to exploit it properly but I think you know, it's a fairly straightforward thing if, <laughs> if you can suddenly get 15 k's on the straight you're, you're not going to turn that down very easily and what impressed you about Lewis just as a driver was it his sheer speed was it his ability to think of everything whilst driving I mean his sheer speed was fairly evident I mean, he obviously had a couple of um, years in, in the sort of junior formula with us um, just prior to that and done exceptionally well I mean there were a few events where he'd, he'd made mistakes and ended up in midfield and was able to just over, overtake everybody so his, his talent was, was fairly obvious right from the word go I still don't think there was a complete conviction that he was ready for Formula 1 when we signed him but it almost was a sort of force majeure situation so he, he joined us and so I don't think anyone quite expected him to be so instantly competitive Nice start by both the McLarens look at Kubica attacking Hamilton we've got yellow flags at the back Hamilton's had some manners put on him by Kubica but he comes round the outside he's also gone round Alonso stunning start by Lewis Hamilton up into third place Raikkonen pulls away Heidfels after him Alonso now has to get past Hamilton what an amazingly composed start by Lewis Hamilton going round yeah. the outside of Fernando Alonso uh, uh, in the yeah. first race yeah. and he, was, <laughs> he was effectively as quick as Fernando really from Melbourne onwards and uh, I think Fernando was one of the <laughs> One of those key figures that didn't expect <laughs> to, to see that, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and do you think there were these intra-team rivalries, Jones, Reutemann, Senna, Prost, Alonso, Hamilton, is there a common link to all of it? Is it just competitiveness? Is that actually the cause of all those problems? 
sheer will to win? I think so. There's slightly different reasons for all those cases that you just mentioned. Um, with Lewis, I mean, he, he was the new kid on the block, but I think the, the only animosity grew out of the, the competitive situation between them. And I think Fernando was certainly expecting Lewis to play second fiddle and, and Lewis wasn't interested in doing that. It was an incredible year. You've had so many incredible years in your career. When you look back at it all, Neil, what was the most enjoyable period for you? I think they've all been enjoyable for different reasons, but um, I mean, the, the early years at Williams were very good just because I was just learning the trade. Uh, and it went from a, a back end of the grid team to a front end of the grid team in such a short space of time. Coming to McLaren, it was a whole different setup. And that, that's evolved so much. I mean, it's a very different team now than it was years ago in sort of 86. So they're all good periods, but for different reasons. Um, yeah, obviously the last few years haven't been the best for us, but still there's a fantastic group of people here too that we're hoping to sort of let off the leash, get their confidence back and, and some really pull us through into a more competitive position during the season. Bringing it up to the here and now, you know, the wind tunnel is about to come on stream. The new technical regime, when David Sanchez comes on board, the end of the year is going to, about to hit the ground running. I mean, do you feel this is, an exciting time for McLaren now. Does it remind you of another period where you were just about to go boom and blossom? I think so. I think everyone's very, very excited about moving forward from where we are. We've we've been in some dark uh, times in, in, in the recent past, not least in Miami, but uh, <laughs> the confidence is coming back to everybody. People aren't, aren't worried about making mistakes. We're trying to encourage all the younger guys to use their talent, which is fairly obvious, but in, in a... In a way that's more productive to to the team and um, have belief in their own abilities because they're all fantastic people. And it's now a good time to be an engineer in Formula One because it seems to me that all the teams are now making money. So suddenly it's not there aren't just four teams with the potential to lure a big engineer somewhere. There are lots of opportunities now up and down the grid. Yeah, there's a tremendous amount of all, all the teams are, have got very large engineering departments. And I think as we started off the conversation, Williams had two, and, <laughs> which was a fantastic ways to learn because you, by default, you had to get involved in everything on the car, which is a, someone joining today tends to get um, specialised very early in their career. We do try to move people around in different roles, but that's not always that straightforward to do. In some ways, it's it's difficult for the guys coming in now to get that experience in 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 different areas. But um, do you think that's important? I think so. Yeah. What just to get a perspective on what the whole car is doing, even if your expertise is gearboxes. Yeah, I mean they're all basically they're all engineers, so you ought to be able to turn your hand to any aspect of engineering and still make a make a good job of it. But having those uh, different inputs directly to you, rather than rather than bothering second hand, I think is a is a great advantage so the more we can do that I think, I think the better for everybody and the better the team will be exciting times ahead for mclaren they're very lucky to still have you neil and thank you very much for your time it's been great to chat a pleasure to talk to you what great advice i can't think of a better mentor for young engineers neil is one of those people whom i could have spoken to all day He's lived at the cutting edge of F1 design for more than 45 years. He's worked with some of the most inspirational designers and drivers that the sport has ever seen. And I loved his descriptions of life with Senna, Prost and Hakkinen in particular. It felt like he took us into a debrief with Senna and Prost discussing the performance of the McLaren MP45. Neil, many thanks for your time. I really enjoyed our chat and I hope to see you again soon. Now, please send in your thoughts and stories about Neil. Were you at Silverstone in 79 when Rega took Williams' first win while being engineered by Neil? What are your memories of the Senna Prost era? Let me know through all the usual means. I'm at Tom Clarkson F1 on Twitter or use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid. Which brings me on to what you sent in about Logan Sargent after last week's show. Many of you have been impressed by the young American speed this year. Let's start with this from Michael Cruikshank. I loved listening to the Logan Sargent podcast. I was working at Pirelli during his F3 season with Prema. It was great to watch him and Oscar Piastri, both great to watch and amazingly quick and both great guys. I love the fact, Michael, that Logan and Oscar's careers have crossed paths so much. And you're right, there was very little to separate them in F3. Next, let's hear from Lisa Carter Garcia. I love the chat with Logan, she says. 
I enjoyed listening to details about his career trajectory and hope he accomplishes all his goals with Williams this year. I can't wait to chant USA when we see him during the driver's parade in Vegas. Yes, Lisa, get that crowd going in Vegas and thank you for your message. And what about this from Neil East? I've been a fan of Logan's since he pushed Piastri to the limit in that F3 championship. Honestly, if he can start stringing weekends together, I think he'll have a bright future in Formula One. Well, I completely agree, Neil. As does Williams team principal, James Fowles, who said pretty much the same thing as you. So well done. And finally, let's hear from Cam N. I really like Logan's attitude. He seems to be talented, humble, and willing to learn. I hope to see more of him. Thanks, Cam, and I'm with you on that. Now we're gonna leave it there for this week. Thanks to everyone who wrote in. And even if I haven't had time to read out your message here, I have read it. And please remember to send in your thoughts and stories about Neil Oatley in time for next week's show. Well, that's pretty much it from me this week. In other news, our F1 Nation review of the 2023 Spanish Grand Prix is out now. We reflect on another dominant display from Max Verstappen and whether Mercedes are finally heading in the right direction after a double podium in Barcelona. And this week's episode of Formula Y asks, why do Formula One teams need simulators? With input from Aston Martin, Alpine and Red Bull. That's available from Friday and just search F1 Nation and Formula One in your podcast app. But that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening. I'll be back next week with another great guest from the world of Formula One. F1 Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 and Audio Boom Studios. Until next time, keep it flat out. <laughs>